Brilliance Audio presents Dark Paradise by Tammy Hogue, performed by Joyce Bean. Night had fallen by the time Mary finally found her way to Lucy's place with the aid of the map Lucy had sent in her first letter. She climbed out of her Honda and stretched, feeling exhausted and rumpled. A calico cat watched her approach from the porch rail, but jumped down and ran away as she climbed the steps, its claws scratching the wood floor as it darted around the corner of the porch and disappeared. Stepping inside, she fumbled along the wall for a light switch, then blinked against the glare of a dozen small bulbs artfully arranged in a chandelier of antlers. Her first thought was that Lucy's abysmal housekeeping talents had deteriorated to a shocking new low. The place was a disaster area, strewn with books, newspapers, notepaper, clothing... Not even Lucy was this big a slob. Mary's pulse picked up the rhythm of fear. Lucy, she called, the tremor in her voice a vocal extension of the goosebumps that were pebbling her arms. The only answer was an ominous silence that pressed in on her eardrums until they were pounding. She stepped over a gutted throw pillow, picked her way around a smashed terracotta urn, and peered into the darkened kitchen area. The refrigerator door was ajar, the light within glowing like the promise of gold inside a treasure chest. The smell, however, promised something less pleasant. She wrinkled her nose and blinked against the sour fumes as she found the light switch on the wall and flicked it upward. Recessed lighting beamed down on a repulsive mess of spoiling food and spilled beer. Milk puddled on the Mexican tile in front of the refrigerator. The carton lay abandoned on its side. Flies hovered over the garbage like tiny vultures. Jesus, Lucy, she muttered. What kind of party did you throw here? And where the hell are you? The pine-covered doors stood open, their contents spewed out of them. Stoneware and china and flatware lay broken and scattered, appropriately macabre place settings for the gruesome meal that had been laid out on the floor. Mary backed away slowly, her hand trembling as she reached out to steady herself with the one ladder-back chair that remained upright at the long pine harvest table. She caught her full lower lip between her teeth and stared through the sheen of tears. She had worked too many criminal cases not to see this for what it was. The house had been ransacked. The motive could have been robbery, or the destruction could have been the aftermath of something else, something uglier. Lucy? She called again, her heart sinking like a stone at the sure knowledge that she wouldn't get an answer. Her gaze drifted to the stairway that led up to the loft where the bedrooms were tucked, then cut to the telephone that had been ripped from the kitchen wall and now hung by slender tendons of wire. Her heart beat faster. A fine mist of sweat slicked her palms. Lucy? She's dead. The words were like a pair of shotgun blasts in the still of the room, Mary wheeled around, a scream wedged in her throat right behind her heart. He stood at the other end of the table, six feet of hewn granite in faded jeans and a chambray work shirt. How anything that big could have sneaked up on her was beyond reasoning. Her perceptions distorted by fear. She thought his shoulders rivaled the mountains for size. He stood there staring at her from beneath the low-riding brim of a dusty black Stetson, his gaze narrow, measuring, his mouth set in a grim, compressed line. His right hand, big with blunt-tipped fingers, hung at his side just inches from a holstered revolver that looked big enough to bring down a buffalo. He spoke again, his voice low and rusty, his question jolting her like a cattle prod. Who are you? Who am I? she blurted out. From the corner of her eye, she caught sight of a foot-long, heavy brass candlestick lying on its side on the table, she inched her fingers down from the back of the chair and slid them around the cold, hard brass, her gaze locked on the stranger. What have you done with Lucy? He tucked his chin back. Nothing. I think you ought to know that I'm not here alone, Mary said with all the bravado she could muster. My husband, Bruno, is out looking around the buildings. You came alone, he drawled, squinting at her. Saw you from the ridge. He'd seen her. He had been watching. A man with a gun had been watching her. 